Good morning, church. This is Pastor Jonathan and Valerie today. Hi, we're so happy to have you with us at first at home. Why don't you go grab a cup of coffee and settle in and enjoy? Walking in the dark is never entirely peaceful to me. I don't know about you, but uh, not knowing for sure what's around the corner is a little bit disconcerting at times, or at times you discover where the chair of the ta table leg is, and you discover it with your small toe. And you've got a busted toe because you just didn't see it. You just didn't see it. And so, you know, that, that darkness is always an issue. Now, many of you know that in my journey, in Jill and I's journey, we lived in the city of Moscow, Russia for many, many years. And every day I rode the metro in Moscow, every day in the city, Generally, I was on the metro, and I have a map of the metro, and this is a picture of the metro, and every intersection is another port or another uh, uh, station where you could change, change routes. This is an incredible, incredible metro system. They have 295 different stops on that map. Uh, they have one train line that goes down 276 feet into the ground, a football field deep. They have an escalator that is pretty impressive. It's 413 feet tall, one escalator. That's one conveyor belt, 413 feet. In fact, when I stand on the bottom of it and look to the top, I cannot see where people get off. It's just too far away. It was really an incredible, incredible thing. Now, we lived in an area uh, called Krasnaya, Krasnaya Varota. It's a little red mark right there uh, in the center, off to the right. There's a little circle, it's red. Now, my route every day, you take that red to the green, to the black, and to the red. And that took me about an hour on the metro, to and from every day. Now, to get to the metro was another hour journey of walking. And so I left my house about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I get to my office, and then I come home about 5, 5.30 at night. Now, most of the time, when I journeyed from my house to the metro, to join 9.7 million people a day, I walked into darkness. It was pure dark. And when we traveled to our destination, to the metro, we went through alleys and back areas. And, and in Moscow, we didn't have a lot of street lights. And especially where we walked is in the back alley. So you just didn't have much light. Now, from October all the way till probably early April, when we went out of the house, it was pitch black. It was just dark. And so you walked in sort of this blind faith that you're okay. You never really thought about anything else. You just simply walked because that's all you could do. And that's where our parable today really comes into focus. You could say it's comfort parable in some ways. When we look at it, maybe some ways it's peaceful parable or even a safe parable because it involves light. It involves light. And there's something powerful about light. And I think we all enjoy that. We like the security that light gives us. Now, the usage of light is paramount throughout the entire biblical text. From Old Testament to New Testament, you always have light as a really big focal point. John chapter 8, verse 12. Here's what Jesus said. I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Do you think there are moments in the disciples' journey? Now, we're talking about a parable today where Jesus talks about salt and light, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. Do you think there's a time in the disciples' journeys when they were talking amongst themselves, and Jesus would stop and say, hey, guys, I want to give you a parable. The disciples would think, oh, no, not another parable. Not another one of these. It's like, it's like the child at home where you tell him a hundred times to shut the refrigerator door. And the child says, oh, not again. Do you ever think they thought that? I don't know. I don't know. But they heard a lot of these parables. Actually, there are 40 of them that Jesus would teach over a period of time. I'm not sure if they felt any way about that, but it was like a discipline, really, in hearing these parables. Because when I read the parables, as I've discovered in the last months, uh, so many times I lose the nuance because of the broad picture. 
I look at a candle on the bushel and, and that's it. That's my picture. And, and yet the details of the parable are so much more than that. And it's really, really a discipline involved in going through a parable. It's a discipline in understanding what that parable is talking about. It's, and for us, this is a parable number five in Jesus' list. That discipline is hard. <laughs> it's like the last push-up you're doing out of the series. It's the last one that's the hardest. So it's the last mile in the marathon. You just push through it, and you have to get it. Or the last chapter in a book for your class is boring, and you got to read it. And it's really that pushing through of something of discipline that's the hardest part of the challenge. And I think parables, to a degree, become that type of discipline. Now, this is the fifth parable Jesus gives. Jesus stops his disciples in this journey in their tracks. It's almost like, okay, time for another parable. Hebrew teaching tools that Jesus uses that we have records of. And each one of these Hebrew teaching tools, the disciples had a front row seat. They got to hear the master talk about that teaching. So we kick off parable number five, the salt of the world and the lamp under a basket. Now, of course, that all makes perfect sense. Or does it? Or does it? The beginning of the parable taking place on a mount just outside of the Sea of Galilee. And it's right after the teaching on the Beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 16. Let me just start there. I'm not going to get through with this today. I'll just point that out, so I don't want you to worry about the clock. I will not get through with it. We'll come back to it next week. But Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read verse 10 through 16. The last portion of the parables, and the first portion of uh, last portion of the Beatitudes, and first portion of parable number 5. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And here's parable number five beginning. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under the foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand, it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, as we know, the Beatitudes, these, these statements, are a series of characteristics or qualities that are honored in the eyes of God. These are things that God wants us as believers to follow, these, these Beatitudes that, that uh, Matthew 5 begins with. Qualities that guide our daily activity, how we conduct our lives. Virtues that bring with them happiness, a quality of life. And that's what the Beatitudes are all, all are about. They're, they're a quality of the Christian life. If we do these things, God will honor them in these ways. And, and as you read through the Beatitudes, you discover there's a, a sense of serving more than demanding. Earning versus taking, or blessing versus cursing. It's always what we can do, not what we can receive. Now, that's not really our culture too much today, is it? It's not what we really see a lot in our culture. Where I just want to serve. I don't care if you give me anything. I want to serve. I want to serve first and re reap rewards second. If I even get a reward, I want to serve. We don't see that as much today, do we? Now, you know I have a pet peeve. I, I just do. I have many of them. But one pet, pet peeve. When I go to a McDonald's or a fast food chain of some sort, and I order my cheeseburger or my fish mac, my fries or my Burger King burger, my taco, or whatever it is, wherever I'm at. And I'm sitting at my table, minding my own consumer business of buying that taco or that burger. And the table next to me is empty. And there's paper and debris left on the table. And I look up from my peaceful hamburger I'm enjoying so much behind the counter, and I see 15 workers talking around their cell phones. 
and there's paper next to me on the table. <laughs> I want to stand up. I want to march back there. I want to take one of their aprons and put it on, go clean the table, throw it away, take that apron back, and go sit down and finish my hamburger. It's what I want to do. Now, I don't do that, thankfully. <laughs> I'm very thankful I don't do that. I do clean tables, yes. But it's not really a service industry, is it? But that's our culture today. I'm not blaming any one person. I think we're all guilty at that sometimes, serving. Finding trash on the ground and picking it up. Seeing something on the ground, shouldn't be there. I just bend over and I pick it up. Now, we raise our kids in a culture that when you're done with something, you just toss it on the ground. And we raise our children in that culture where they would want to copy the culture. And we say, no, you don't do that. When you are done with something, put it where it belongs. And we raise them in a culture that they had to learn that beyond what was culturally acceptable even to them. So after this teaching of these eight qualities of the Beatitudes about the Christian life, Jesus jumped into a second message of the day. Parable number five. Light it in a bushel and salt it lost its value. You remember the song growing up in a Sunday school, This Little Light of Mine? I'm not going to sing it. You don't want that. I don't want to do it. We sang that as a child. and We all understand parable number five, don't we? Or do we understand parable number five? As I approach this parable, it's really important to note the underpinning of teaching that he gives in this parable is how to live in the midst of persecution. That's the underpinnings of the parable. How to live in the midst of persecution. Now, America is not known as one of the persecution capitals of the world. It's not what we're known for. Quite the opposite, actually. It's one of the freest places on the planet to live your faith. In Walla Walla, we have 89 churches in the city of Walla Walla. It doesn't sound like persecution to me. But yet parable number five has undertones all through it of living our life in the midst of persecution. Now, usually when we read this parable, we do it on a standalone basis. We take these two, two verses and we read them by themselves. And the Beatitudes, verse 3 through 12, we read separate as a standalone as well. But they're not standalone. They are the same time. As Jesus ends one, he begins the, the next one. As he exhales, he inhales and continues to teach. He's not separated these by components. These are one teaching. It takes place at one location, at one time, on that mount right outside the Sea of Galilee. And between verse 12 and verse 13, it's only where Jesus would catch his breath and continue on with his teaching. Continuing on. So to understand the parable, I really have to understand the Beatitudes as well and what those Beatitudes teach in the verses above. Now, I'm not going to go through those today. It's too much. But I do want to start in verse 10. So read with me from verse 10 to verse 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way as they persecuted the prophets who were before you, this is not new. Now, here's the thing about persecution. It's that, well, we don't like it. We don't like persecution, do we? I don't see anyone saying, man, I just really, I really crave more persecution. You get up in the morning and you read your Bible and you say, all right, Lord, here's my prayer. Lord, bless me today with a double portion of persecution. I want the blessing of being persecuted for you today. I don't want a single shot of that thing. I want a double shot. I want it to rain down persecution all day long. I want to feel the shower of persecution upon me. Is that your prayer in the morning? <laughs> it's not mine. It's not mine. Use our understanding of persecution is what is that we cannot pass out tracts without permission or maybe have to follow some mandates in the law that we don't agree with. But 
And that may be true to a degree. It, it, it could very well be true. But most of our understanding as Americans for persecution, that trial of faith is from stories we read about missionaries, about events that have taken place in other areas around the country. And we do live in a free country, and I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful I was born in America. I don't know why I was. Oh, but for the sovereignty of God, I don't know why, but I'm thankful for it. I pray every day for our leadership that God give us a land of peace, that we can bless others all around the world through our, our peace and our, our prosperity. But uh, my prayer is, Lord, keep persecution far from my door. I don't want it. I don't want persecution. I want to be at peace with my neighbors. Still, all through Jesus' teaching and subsequently through the disciples' teaching, there's a part of the reality of the Christian life that's called persecution. It's part of the journey that they face. And parable number five speaks to that background. To keep your light shining, even in the midst of the darkest hours. Now, I think here would be the fine point for me today. We have no guarantee that persecution is not far off our doorstep. We don't have a guarantee of that. I read the article this morning about the uh, pastor in, in Canada whose son is now facing difficulty because of his preaching there. And I don't know all the details of that, but uh, I don't think persecution necessarily is all that far off. And we have a level of uncomfortableness, uncomfortableness. I don't even know if that's a word, but it sounds pretty good, though. We have a level of being uncomfortable with that concept. But I see it rising all across our land. We see the fringes of it today. In, in TV, sitcoms, use a lot of Christianity as their gag lines or their punchlines, don't they? They'll read the Bible in mockery, or they'll pray in just, or they'll make fun of Christianity in some way, a preacher and an extremism. So we see it, don't we? They make fun of that. Fringe groups scream out prejudiced if I say something in a biblical text that they disagree with. We see it. And we have religious extremists that add fuel to many of those claims. So there are three basic questions concerning persecution and the underpinnings we find in the scripture. And I want to look at those three questions. I'm not going to get through them this week. I'm just going to kind of go through the gist of them. Question number one is, why are Christians persecuted? Why? And our text, this parable number five, our text explains it. He'll explain it. How did Jesus expect his followers to react to persecution? And the third question we'll look at is, why, what warnings did Jesus give about negative reactions by us to persecution? Now, let me just say, and I, I will probably close with this concept today. Before I move on, let me just say this. Persecution is never personal. Persecution is never personal. It's not you they don't like. It's the faith you stand for. It's not personal. It's based on that which is within you. Their hate isn't against you, but the one you love, and that's Jesus. That's where persecution rises from. Always remember that. Persecution is never against you. It's against what you believe in. It's, believe in, it's against your faith. In all my travels to areas where we were strongly, they were strongly against Christianity, they're against Christians of any sort. In those locations, it was never me that was targeted or threatened. It was never me. Although I was a recipient of it, it wasn't me. It was rather what I held dear in my heart, that being my faith in Jesus Christ. They hated my faith. They hated what I stood for. They challenged my faith. They threatened my faith. Not me. I was a recipient of threats against faith, not against me personally. Any suffering I would endure was not personal. It was always against what I stood for, and that being Jesus Christ. Persecution is never personal. It's always against what we believe in. It's against our faith. Now, here's why the Bible gives reason that believers are persecuted. John chapter 3, verse 19 through 20. This is the judgment 
that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light. That's it. That's the reason. Because there is a, a, a conflict between light and darkness and they cannot coexist. One has to give way to the other. There's no way around it. The fallen sin nature of man that came with Adam and Eve loves darkness. That fallen nature loves darkness. It's the nature of sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. So we have this, this battle going on of light and darkness. And it's from the beginning of time until now until the end of time where darkness and light cannot coexist. And the enemy hates the light that you have in your heart. It opposes the light of God. This is a judgment that light comes into our world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates light and whoever does not come to light for fear of his deeds will be exposed. So we have this, this conflict of light and darkness that we face. Salt and light are two incredible, valuable commodities that our world needs today. They need the light. They need to see Jesus. And our culture today needs salt because it's the preservative. In a moral decay and a moral decline. Salt is a preservative. It's what we use to preserve things and keep them from spoiling. And we're light and we're salt. God has placed us here to show forth His love, to show forth His light, to be the preservative in our culture. And I'm going to stop there today because I, I don't want to get into that first section without having time to complete it. We're persecuted not because of us, rather because of our faith. Years ago, I was speaking in a large auditorium in England, and uh, mostly younger people under under 20 in the audience. A couple thousand, I would guess, would be there that night. And gave a, an appeal to pray for Jesus to be your Lord and and there are a number that had come forward, and our, my team was praying with various various individuals. And a young man came up to me, and and uh, he was just closest to me. He didn't seek me out by any means, but he was just happened to be closest to me. And so a young teenage boy, and I went and stood with him, and I said, how can I pray for you? He said, I want to receive Jesus. What you're talking about today, I've never gone to church. I don't know anything about this, but I want what you're telling me. I want Jesus. I need this person, Jesus Christ. So I prayed with them. We talked for maybe 30 minutes that night. We had literature. We always left people designed for them, their age, and gave them a Bible and uh, gave them some areas to read and gave them some Bible study designed for his age. And, and uh, we had a contact church in the local area that would be a great place for them and got them all the information. So he had a, he had a nice little pile of paperwork there. He came with a group of kids that night. And after a while, his friends came down to see him. And I had already stepped away from him. He was on his own. He was kind of just looking at his paperwork and his Bible. And the kids walked up around him that he came with, his friends. One of them reached over and took the material, looked at it for a few minutes, and then threw it in the kid's face. He flinched, and the paper went all over the ground. And I was, I was so angry. I wasn't maybe 10 feet away. I was ready to start hitting heads. So angry. But I didn't. I felt to stand there and just watch, and I did. I wanted to see what that young man would do. And here's what he did. This new believer that just discovered light in his dark world. He bent down and just piece by piece began to pick up all his papers. He gathered them all together, he held them in his hands. He looked at his friends. He looked at his papers. He turned around and walked away. 
I'll tell you what, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. But we are light in a dark world. And that's what God's called us to be. He's called us to show forth His light. Stand with me, if you will. As I studied this text over the last couple of weeks, I found some things that I found fascinating, just incredible in our journey of faith. And I'm going to be going into that next week. I'll be talking more about it next week. I really hope you come back to finish this parable with me. Parable number five. Don't you dare say to me, oh, pastor, not another parable. No. Parable number five next week. We'll finish it. We'll keep it going there. But this week, I want you to think about these two statements. We do face opposition. It's impossible not to. We're in a godless world. How can light not face darkness? How can that happen? It can. Realize that. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of it. No. But realize it. And number two, you're light. You're salt. And God placed you here for this time. God placed you here in this culture, in this season, with a great, powerful message for this time. Join with me in prayer. God, this morning, I just pray, Lord. I pray for our lives, that we are that salt and we are that light in an age that is full of darkness and and fear and concerns and, and there seems to be this moral decay. Yet in the midst of that, you've called me here to show the love of God, to welcome people in darkness into the light, to see Jesus, a Redeemer, a Healer, a soon coming King. And God, I pray as we just do what we are designed to do, show the light of God and be salt that God, you will use us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey friends, thanks for joining us for Church at Home. We pray that God blesses you as you've watched and listened to His Word. Today, if you would like to connect with us, do not hesitate. You can visit us online at www.firstassemblyww.com or you can just give us a call in the office. We pray for God's blessing over you for this coming week. Bye-bye.